from an early age, were told not to judge a book by its cover. Just because someone has a face like a bulldog licking piss off a thistle, it doesn't mean to say that they're ugly inside. And just because a movie has a terrible cover, does not mean to say that it is bad also. But what if I was to tell you that this is not always the case? I am Chris Hall, and today I bring you... I'm Still Waiting For You. I'm Still Waiting For You is a teen slasher movie from the year 2000, even though it looks and feels as though it comes from the 1990s. No, no, no. AD. 1990s AD. The film centres around Mandy Anderson, whose mother is killed after an awkward evening of poorly dubbed and poorly lit backseat car sex. She's killed by an escaped lunatic with a hook for a hand. No, really, that is the plot. Sadly for Mandy, her and her father happen to be driving past the crime scene and are so insufferably sweet they look as if they've just escaped from a hallback greetings card. There we meet a man who cannot operate a hat and the movie attempts to tug on our heartstrings and fails spectacularly. So profound is the emotional impact on this young girl that she grows up to become Chucky off of the Rugrats. After 18 minutes of D-grade 90210 skits and inadvertent humour, we learn that the hook-handed man has escaped and is out for revenge. Will he get his revenge? Will Michael live down the embarrassment of his mother's sex education class? And will Michael's mother ever be able to live out her dream of becoming a Cher tribute act? Find out next time on Dragon Ball Z. This movie is wholly unique in every way, shape and form, and any resemblance to any of the movies that came out around the same time is purely coincidental. So much so that the makers of the movie decided to add the caption, in the tradition of I know what you did last summer, to the front of the box. So immediately, we know we're in good territory with this one. Damn, that must have hurt. Okay, so as a disclaimer, I've never seen I Know What You Did Last Summer, and as such, I can't really do a cross-comparison between these two movies. Though, to be honest, doing a cross-comparison would be pretty damn unfair. Though with that said, this movie provides us with such a cornucopia of cinematic silliness that I could talk about it for literally... 11 minutes and 26 seconds. <laughs> Drive, bitch. The first half of the movie is where all the silly, dumb and downright daft directing decisions take place and they do make for some genuinely enjoyable experiences and had the movie been on this same silly tone throughout it, it would be an instant buy. I mean as well as some of the stuff I've already mentioned, we have a character called Chloe who is a feisty young gal who is accompanied by her signature theme music wherever she goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, by feisty, what I mean to say is that she's downright psychotic and she's a loose cannon ready to blow. And when she does blow, she blows in a way which is just so violent and shocking and traumatic that I simply have to show you it. We also have an awkward masturbation joke. Hi there. Which is about as far as character development as we get for him. And the greatest psychiatrist in the world ever. Me. Tell me and you'll be free. Incidentally, that act of unspeakable violence I just mentioned was so severe that it had to call the police in. And it's that point you realise that Mandy's father cannot act. Or rather, he stops acting around that point. <laughs> Harriet! No, Ward was not cheating on me. Yes, he was, and Harriet was cheating on me. <laughs> what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in the car. I should, however, tell you that whilst the first half is definitely where all the humour can be found, it's not laugh a minute bad. And as we start to enter the second half, the humour does pretty much fade away into nothing. And while I was being somewhat flippant earlier, saying that it's like watching some teenage drama from the 90s, it does, while you're watching, it definitely feel like that or be incredibly out of step with what teenagers at the time dressed and spoke like. I mean, I was seriously expecting someone to shout cowabunga or gnarly at any moment. Because, I mean, dude, that had been so totally bogus. Seriously, it's like watching a Halloween special to 90210 or Save by the Bell or Boy Meets World, or be it gorier and seedier. And, of course, without 30-year-olds playing high school students, because, I mean, what? Cag me with a spoon. Ugh. Oh, wowzers, I appear to be having some, some totally tubular 90s flashbacks. <laughs> A cowbunker, gnarly, radical. Mom.
You're fine. Now to the... Now to the movie's credit, they do reference just how daft having a hook-handed man as their lead bad guy is, and they do do something with it. Though it's only something, it's nothing really big or bold, and of course expecting something more intellectually substantial from a movie that is, in the tradition of, is expecting a bit much, but still, they do make reference to it, and I'm of the opinion that if you are going to make reference to something like that, you should do something with it, otherwise the audience at home are just going to feel rather ripped off when you don't do anything with it. They're just going to sit there thinking, ooh, ooh, they're making references to me here, they're, they're going to go somewhere with this, they're setting something up. And then when we get to the end of the movie, they don't. And we feel mighty disappointed. Hey, Kathy, you know that story about the hurt guy? Yeah, like in Girl Scouts? Yeah. Once again, expecting some kind of phenomenological or phenomenographical deconstruction of stereotypes within horror cinema, maybe expecting a bit much from a movie like this. But given the sheer amount of stereotypes and cliches within it, and the fact they make reference to that fact earlier on, you could be forgiven from thinking that they're going to do something with it. But they don't. Which makes me worried that they may have included these because they felt that this is how you do it. That this is a good idea. I mean, Jesus, this is a movie where they have a stereotypical cheerleader complete with the full regalia for crying out loud. It's a movie where when they're being chased by the bad guy, they decide to hide in a house in the middle of nowhere. And this isn't some house they just happen upon. This is a house they knew about in advance and they actively decide to go to there. So they decide to run off into the middle of nowhere to hide at Grandma's house. And while they're there, when the, ch when the monster does catch up with them and the cheerleader's being chased, where does she go? Does she run outside to get help? Does she run to the police station? Does she run off to her friend who's got a shotgun? No, she decides to hide upstairs. I'm... I know I shouldn't get angry about it, but... This is a movie that can be clever when it wants to be. No, really, it can. Yeah. Okay, so the first half of the movie is definitely where we have all the bad humour elements of it. But the second half, as soon as they get to Grandma's house, things just suddenly change. We suddenly get some fairly good pacing, some genuinely good suspense, and some fairly creative shots. It's almost as though someone just changes reels on you halfway through and the silly, dumb, poorly realised teen drama stuff has just been cut away. And we find ourselves with this new second movie which, whilst not brilliant by any stretch or means of the imagination, is still good in comparison. It's a movie in which the, the pacing is better, the writing is better, the directing is better and the acting is better. I mean, this is a part in which throw away lines, bits we thought were throw away lines in the earlier half of the movie suddenly become a lot more significant and almost foreshadow future events in the movie and granted the quality of the acting may have improved because all the bad and bland actors have been killed off but still with a little bit more creativity, a little bit more rigour this could be a damn good B movie but instead, we don't get that. We don't get the discipline. And these grassroots of something resembling talent are squandered on this. 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 <sighs> However, with all that said, the final half isn't really enough to save the movie because it simply isn't enough. It's only about 30 minutes of the movie that's genuinely good, and even then there's a few bum notes in it, and maybe the fact that it looks so good is because it's good in comparison only. Maybe on its own it would just be only slightly less bad, if that makes at all sense. And yes, the movie is 90 minutes long, and thus it isn't a half because a half of 90 minutes is 45 minutes and 30 minutes would only be a third so it's not a half but you're not my dad god i wish i was her daddy jack reef why look at her she's just about screwing him right in front of us yeah so what about being jack so if i was jack i'd get to spank her when she got home so the big question can i recommend it On balance, 
No, it's a very, very shallow movie that at times appears to have some depth to it. However, it only flirts with the idea of being something more than a dumb, cliché slasher movie and never really commits itself to being something better, which it could have done with a little bit more rigour and creativity thrown into it. Had it stayed in the same silly mode it was in earlier sections of the movie, then it really would have been a fun little excursion. But the fact that it switches means you can't really recommend it for being so bad it's good as it's not really funny for long enough. Nor can you really recommend it for being good because it's not really good for long enough. And at absolute worst it's a horribly cliched movie that does nothing big or clever or is at all scary. And thus it creates a fairly uninteresting experience for the audience. As a whole the movie just kind of exists in this middle ground. Never being quite sufficient to satisfy any need. Of course, I said no rather reluctantly. There is some entertainment to be had in the early sections because of just how odd and silly it can be. And the end, well, the ending sections are genuinely interesting for just to see where it goes with it. So if you are at all interested, then I recommend that you give it a watch. I mean, it's not the best of the worst, but it's at least half in the bag. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to critique some nostalgia and get angry with Joe. Ugh. Goodbye. Yeah.